All right, we're on volume one, book six, Consolidation. And in book five, we've just had the storming of the Bastille, and in the subsequent weeks following it, where there have been a few executions, a few heads on pikes, and we're beginning to see the sort of justice, the justice of the uh, advocacy class, or those who would be insurrectionaries. But more than anything else now, we're going to talk about what they try and do to consolidate the event. So chapter one is make the constitution. Here perhaps is the place to fix a little more precisely, says Carlyle, what these two words French Revolution shall mean. All things are in revolution, in change from a moment to moment, clearly echoes Heraclitus. We both step and do not step, are and are not in the same rivers, who is attributed to the expression of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. So he's trying to attribute that movement to political movement and political revolt. Revolution, you answer, means speedier change, says Carlyle, anticipating how you will try and answer his question. If everything's in change, then what's a revolution? Well, it's speedier change. Well, how speedy then? Asks Carlyle, he pipes in again. Revolution means here open, violent rebellion and victory of disimprisoned anarchy against corrupt, worn out authority. Worn out being crucial. How anarchy breaks prison, bursts from the infinite deep, and rages uncontrollable, immeasurable, enveloping a world in phases after phases of fever frenzy, till the frenzy burning itself out. And what elements of new order it held, since all force holds such, developing themselves, the uncontrollable begot, if not reimposed, yet harnessed, and its mad forces made to work towards their object as sane or regulated ones. For as the hierarchies and dynasties of all kinds, theocracies, aristocracies, autocracies, strumpetocracies, have ruled over the world. So a lot of those would be would have been discussed back in Aristotle's politics as modes of government, but he adds strump strumpetocracies to it, um, which is his own expression, meaning the rule of harlots, which is described the reign of Louis XV in his uh, works on Diderot. The destructive wrath he prescribes to San Colotism, uh, invoking the wrath of the Iliad. The age of miracles has come back. Behold a world phoenix in fire consummation and fire creation. Death birth of a world. So it's similar to the romantic invigoration, but you can't help but feel there's a little bit of a snide remark there from Carlyle that uh, the revolution itself to this, the classes who would condone it, it is seen as a miracle, despite them as a class meant to be the product of the Enlightenment, meant to be disbelieving miracles. They're meant to be something from medieval Middle Ages. They're meant to have outgrown those superstitions. Yet for them, this revolution is a miracle. And uh, they're quite steadfast in believing that. San Colotism will burn much, but what is incombustible, it will not burn. Um. And again, Carlyle's always looking for what is steadfast, what is eternal, in even in the flux. Where the French Revolution specially is, so this is one of the key questions, where exactly is it? We know it's in Paris, but how widespread is it? And in, with which people, with which classes? Well, it's in the King's Palace, in His Majesty's or Her Majesty's Managements, and maltreatments, cabals, imbecilities and woes. That's what some few answer. Uh, but exactly whom we do not answer. In the National Assembly answer a large mixed multitude, who accordingly seat themselves in the reporter's chair. So they've grasped the National Assembly as a fulcrum of the revolution. The National Assembly, named now Constituent Assembly, goes its course, making the Constitution. But the French Revolution also goes its course. So Carlyle disagrees with those saying that the revolution is in the National Assembly. Where is the revolution? The revolution has become entropic. It's not controlled within the National Assembly. Now the Constituent Assembly, they'll try to make the Constitution. They'll try to do the, the consolidation here. 
in volume one book six but for carlisle the genie is out of the bottle much wider than that this is the difference between the, the idea of you wanting to make a controlled revolution that being the advocacies and what really happens uncontrolled and august national assembly becomes for us little other than a sanhedrim of pedants chapter two the constituent assembly do nothing, only keep agitating, debating, and things will destroy themselves, says Carlyle. So we can see here an elaboration on his opinion there that the uncontrolled revolution is out, but those in the Constituent Assembly haven't realised yet, or haven't, or won't accept that truth. Singular what Gospels men will believe, even Gospels according to Jean-Jacques, obviously Rousseau. It was the fixed faith of these national deputies, as of all thinking Frenchmen, that the Constitution could be made, that they there and then were called to make it. How, with the toughness of old Hebrews or Ishmaelite Muslim, did the otherwise light unbelieving people persist in this their credo quia impossibile, which is, I believe, because it is impossible, reference to Tertullian. It sees itself, the assembly, incessantly forced away from its infinite divine task of perfecting the theory of irregular verbs to finite terrestrial tasks. Carlyle will also talk about the assembly doing this, um, you know, trying to perfect the theory of irregular verbs for him. It's a catch-all for mindless debate and pointless pedantry. It is the sinecure of revolutionary France, this national assembly. It emits... Pacifactory proclamations, not a few, but with more or less result. It authorises the enrolment of National Guards. And it delivers men from the Lantern. Lantern we had in the last chapter of the last book. It's basically the hanging post. It's the final justice. It's the sentence to death. It can listen to congratulatory addresses, which arrive daily by the sackful, mostly in King Cambyses's vein. King Cambyses' vein is a reference from Henry the First, uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One. They see themselves this assembly as the embodiment of parliamentary eloquence, but with endless debating, we get this: what rights of man written down, promulgated, true paper basis of all paper constitutions, neglecting cry the opponents to declare the duties of man. So, we get the rights of man, and it's neglected the duties of man. Classic revolutionary move. Forgetting, answer we, to ascertain the mights of man, and Carlyle has to go one further. Um, so a typical Burkean response would be, uh, you've written down on paper the rights of man, but you've forgotten the duties of man. Carlyle goes one further and says, yes, you've also forgotten the mights of man, which is a rule of might, which is intrinsic into every political framework you try and wreck. One of the fatalist omissions, says Carlyle. Nay, sometimes, as on the 4th of August, our National Assembly, fired suddenly by an almost preternatural enthusiasm, will get through whole masses of work in one night. A memorable night, this 4th of August. So we have a date. We're on the 4th of August, 1789. And this is what he's talking about. One of the central events of the French Revolution was to abolish feudalism. This is when they formally do so. Um, debates in the chamber on the 3rd of August, 1789 and then the August Decrees, or 19 Decrees between the 4th and the 11th of August, 1789, by the National Constituent Assembly during the Revolution, concerning the abolition of feudalism, privileges of nobility, and seigneurial rights. According to the New Time, the New Church of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, this is where they will be now, it has its causes and it also has its effects. The perennial rule... Ubi homines sunt modis sunt, which is Latin for there are modes wherever there are men. It's uh, from Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's von der Jahre. It proves valid. So, the saying there are modes where there are men proves valid. And again, this is what we're talking about when, when the States General were assembling, there was a procession. Carlyle was always interested in telling you who was composing the procession, what players were going to be in the States General, because he believes in this saying, um, basically where there are modes, uh, there are men, and vice versa. You can't take the political theory, you 
you can't take the political body away from the characters who are composing it. There is a right side, a côte droite, a left side, a côte gauche, sitting on Monsieur le Président's right hand or on his left, the côte droite conservative, the côte gauche destructive. Intermediate is Anglomaniac constitutionalism, or two-chamber royalism, with its Muniers, Lallies, fast verging towards non-entity. So, the centre cannot hold. There are also blusters, Barrel Mirabeau, Younger Mirabeau, not without wit. Dusky Despremenil does nothing but sniff and ejaculate, so nothing new there. The left side is also called the Dolion side. Um, again, we saw the Duc d'Olean was a uh, cousin to the king, but of, of the Jacobin faction. So really much a driver from the top uh, of hard left politics against his own class, more or less. There likewise sits C. Green Robespierre. So of course Robespierre is among these on the hard left. Pipple. Uh, you know, the people is what he addresses. Peuple, such, according to Robespierre, ought to be the royal method of promulgating laws. Peuple, this is, this is the law I have framed for thee. Dost thou accept it? This man, observes Mirabeau, will do somewhat. He believes every word he says, so Mirabeau is looking at Robespierre being like, this guy is dangerous. Abbe Sies is busy with mere constitutional work. And we have had Abbe Sears before. It's this man, Emmanuel Yusuf Sears. So he's busy with the actual constitutional work, the attempt to consolidate. Mirabeau, well conspicuous among all parties, is raised above and beyond them all. So we said before that Mirabeau is, ba is basically a king within this National Assembly, a de facto ruler. This man, says Carlyle, rises more and more. Consider that they are 1,200 that they are not only speak, but read their speeches, and even borrow and steal speeches to read, with twelve hundred fluent speakers, and there's Noah's deluge of vociferous commonplace silence unattainable may well seem the only blessing in life. So again, more idea of the talk of this constituent assembly. So we move on to chapter three, the general overturn. Royalty languishes forsaken of its war god and all its hope. Till once the Ile Beauf will rally again, the scepter is departed. From King Louis, it's gone over to the Salle de Menu. Slight uh, allusion there to the war god Broly, who has fled. The queen sits weeping in her inner apartment, surrounded by weak women. She is, uh, quote, at the height of unpopularity, close quote. He's referenced Noah's deluge from Genesis. The scepter is departed. It's also a reference to Genesis. And the queen being at the height of her unpopularity is from uh, Michaud's Biographie Universelle Ancienne et Moderne. That France should see her nobles resist the irresistible, inevitable, with the face of angry men, was unhappy. But not unexpected. But with the face of sense and pettish children, this was her peculiarity. They understood nothing. Would understand nothing. King Louis has his new ministry. Mere popularities. Old President Pompignon. Necker coming back in triumph. And other such. I mentioned Necker before that he wrote, um, returning back from Basel, that he was entering the abyss. And this is, uh, his return was on the 16th of July, 1789, as we had said previously. What a plotting of aristocrats, plotting of Dorleon, uh, what brigands, preternatural terror, and the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, enough, the markets are scarce of grain, plentiful only in tumult. So they still haven't solved, despite all this revolution, the simple fact of hunger, which is the revolution from below. Again, think of the revolution as a pincer movement. You have people like Dorleon from above, plotting of aristocrats, that's the revolution from above. The revolution from below is hunger. And it's the sandwich that cracks the old regime. Starvation has been known among French commonalty. Before this, known and familiar. Did not we see them? In the year 1775, presenting in sallow faces, in wretchedness and raggedness, their petition of grievances. So again, that's how merely from below 
previously, such as in 1775, is not enough, but it's it's the perfect storm of from below and from above, which has resulted in the Bastille falling. It was a fixed prophecy of our old Marquis, which no man would listen to, that such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, would end by general overturn, the coup de général. Um... He's invoking here um, the overturn. The over, the general overturn is what is occurring in 1789, but it comes after these smaller overturns, the, we, which we saw earlier, this constant overturn of the controller of the finances and so on, uh, it, where it almost felt like each time you're, you're running the gauntlet of this hunger, of this failure to enact it, you're playing Russian roulette that this time the when the barrel locks into position it will be loaded and so it is proven a government by blind man's buff stumbling along has reached the precipice inevitable for it so you will always reach the nth time every time you increase the ingredients for revolution you're running the probability that uprising will happen the ingredients are think of them as sort of probability occurring events and this government has run them so many times that it has turned up the, uh, what Carlyle considers here the general overturn. Greek meeting Greek in high places has long gone on, yet still bread comes not. Five full-grown millions of such gaunt figures, so again, this, this hunger uh, will not cease, while children of the desert, ferocity and appetite, strength grounded on hunger, sort of personification of these primordial feelings as for the tax gatherer he long hunting as a biped of prey may now find himself hunt himself hunted as one he kind of alluded to this at the end of the previous book his majesty's exchequer will not fill up the deficit this season it is the notion of many that a patriot majesty being the restorer of french liberty has abolished most of the taxes though for their private ends some men make a secret of it where will this end in the abyss, one may prophesy, whither all delusions are at all moments travelling, where this delusion has now arrived. The seniors did what they could, enrolled in national guards, fled with shrieks, complaining to heaven and earth. The scepter has departed, whither knows what. So he's kind of recurring on some of these themes. Strasbourg has seen riots. Okay, that's an indication that it's sprawling further than just Paris. And on the cliffs of Dover... Over all the marches of France, there appear this autumn two signs on the earth, emigrant flights of French seigneurs, emigrant winged flights of French game. Feudalism is struck dead. And that's why we are on the abolition of feudalism in France uh, wiki entry here, because this is kind of just a focal point to where, where we are in Carl's telling in August 1789. Feudalism is struck dead. But here, crucially, of course, would Carlyle agree that feudalism was struck dead because the people in the National uh, Constituent Assembly decided it to be struck dead? So, no, of course not. It's struck dead because the very lifeblood has gone out of it. Feudalism is struck dead not on parchment only and by ink, but in very fact by fire, say, by self-combustion. Chapter 4. In Q. If we look now at Paris, one thing is too evident— that the bakers' shops have got their cues, or tales. The strong men of the market and the strong women fail not with their bouquets and speeches. Abbe Fauchet, famed in such work for Abbe Lefebvre, could only distribute powder, blesses tricolour cloth for the National Guard and makes it a national tricolour flag, victorious or to be victorious in the cause of civil and religious liberty all over the world. National Guards protect the Paris corn market, this is the one thing they've they've managed to do is to re-term and reorganize the Garde Française as a national guard, uh, obedient to the Constituent Assembly, obedient to the likes of Mirabeau, not the King. And such a constitution, little short of miraculous, one that shall consolidate the revolution. These are the claims of what they're making. Yes, we know you're hungry. We know there's guards uh, protecting a corn market. There's queues everywhere, but. Trust us, we're making a constitution. You know, it will consolidate the revolution. The revolution is finished then? 
Mayor Bailey and all respectable friends of freedom would fain think so. Your revolution, like jelly sufficiently boiled, needs only to be poured into shapes of constitution and consolidated therein. Unhappy friends of freedom, consolidating a revolution. So, people like Bailey, who we saw earlier, Mayor of uh, Paris at this time, he's happy with the extent that they've gone. They've gone this far and no further. Revolution is finished. But of course, those hungry on the streets, those wanting to see the king deposed entirely, this. So, you you don't get to consolidate a revolution like that. Sorry, Bailey, not how it happens. Chapter 5, The Fourth Estate. We've seen what a third estate can do, so what will a fourth estate even conjure up as a thing that could be imagined? Pamphleteering opens its abysmal throat wider and wider. Abbe Renal is one, and he has his uh, letter to the Constituent Assembly. And this is the man here, Guillaume Thomas François Renal. 12th of April 1713 to the 6th of March 1796. French writer, man of letters during the Age of Enlightenment. So he's writing his letter to the Constituent Assembly, th thinking, why, why can't you not give more? So as acrid, corrosive as the spirit of slows and coppers is Marat. So Jean-Paul Marat, another agitator from below. He writes Friend of the People, uh, which was his newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple, Marat's newspaper, uh, saying, struck already with the fact that the National Assembly, so full of aristocrats, can do nothing except dissolve itself. So they're even telling the National Assembly now, you've got too many aristocrats within your, your own assembly, dissolve. Um, some interesting stuff. He's, uh, again, quoting Romans with the powers that be, sort of invocation of the Bible again. But also it was interesting to note that the phrase consolidate the revolution comes from Desmoulins. Camille Desmoulins. Combien le peuple c'était de ce livre rouge va consolider la révolution? So people like Marat, Jean-Paul Marat here, and his newspaper, people like this man, Guillaume Thomas Francois Renal, are agitating even for the closure of the National Assembly. This is a cruel lusus of nature. The lusus nature, the sport of nature. So Carlyle says he has very little uh, sympathy for the likes of Bailey or those or Camille de Moulin who say let's consolidate the revolution w where it is because they were the ones who have they've opened Pandora's box Camille de Moulin has appointed himself procureur general de la lanterne attorney general of the lamp iron and pleads not with atrocity under an atrocious title editing weekly his brilliant revolutions of Paris and Brabant patriot proposes his motion. If it finds any supporters, they make him mount on a chair and speak. If he is applauded, he prospers and redacts. If he is hissed, he goes away. These are sort of proposals for what a fourth estate could look like. It's just absolute lunacy at this point, and we really see it's mob rule. A fourth estate here means mob rule. That's what they're getting at. That's what it's disintegrating towards. And so it closes out it closes out Volume 1, Book 6 with the following paragraph. Unhappy mortals, such tugging and lugging and throttling of one another to divide in some not intolerable way the joint felicity of man in this earth, when the whole lot to be divided is such a feast of shells. Diligent are the three hundred, none equals Scipio Americanus in dealing with the mobs, but surely all these things bode ill for the consolidating of a revolution. Scipio Americanus, of course, is Lafayette, so he was for the revolution, but he's quite good at dealing with the mobs to stop this fourth estate from getting too far out of hand. But for how long? How long can the Scipio Americanus be the one that holds it all back? Well, next we'll talk about the insurrection of women, which it happens in October 1789, which will be the final book of Volume 1, Volume 1 being the Bastille, that first turning of 1789, and we'll be ready to go into the depths of Volume 2.